Black hair ain't safe nowhere. The policing of Afro hair in African workplaces, just when I thought African women in African workplaces in Africa were safe to wear their natural hair, my Ugandan girlfriend expressed to me that she was very intentional in styling her beautifully locked hair in conservative buns so as not to rock the boat at her job where she is a senior exec. Her Zimbabwean friend concurred. I was shocked because after all, we are in Africa, the birthplace of African hair. Welcome to Blacks to Africa. I'm Tadre Delora Mornier, a California native living my best life in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for coming along for the ride. I hope that you are informed, entertained, and inspired to Blacks it to Africa. Y'all, I'm back. I'm back in the saddle. You don't understand. Auntie was down bad. I missed a couple of weeks because my primary recording device was broken. She was down for the count. And this will be my third time recording this podcast because I tried to record on an old iPhone 7. I tried to record on my laptop. As you can imagine, the sound and the uh, visual quality was really bad. It was really bad, but I am so happy to be back and I'm happy to talk to you about something that is near and dear to my heart. I hope that it resonates with you. On this episode of Black Sit to Africa, I am discussing the Crown Act, a law designed to prohibit discrimination against natural hair. I will cover why this act is necessary and I will use it as yet another example of how black people are locked out of spaces and places simply for being our natural selves. Given this inescapable fact, I implore you to come home where you can step into your truest self and mitigate the harm caused by a system that was not designed for you to thrive. So what is the Crown Act? The Crown Act was created in 2019 by Dove and the Crown Coalition in partnership with then State Senator Holly J. Mitchell of California, a beautiful black woman with dark blonde sister locks. The Crown Act is an acronym for creating a respectful and open world for natural hair. It is a law designed to prohibit discrimination against natural hairstyles, particularly those commonly associated with black people. The Crown Act recognizes that black people have historically faced discrimination and bias in the workplace and within academic institutions. Our natural hair textures and styles are often used as an excuse to meet out unfair treatment. This law seeks to protect against discrimination by prohibiting employers and schools from enforcing grooming policies that disproportionately impact people of color. The fact that a law needs to be written, advocated for, and ratified is very telling. So why is the Crown Act relevant? Why is it necessary? Because people got to eat. Because our species thrives in environments where we feel psychologically and physically safe. Because being denied access to opportunities severely hinders a person's growth and ability to self-actualize. It is necessary because humans are petty. One egregious example of hair discrimination in the workplace is the case of Chastity Jones, a black woman who was offered employment at an Alabama insurance company on the condition that she cut her locks. I can't even imagine someone fixing their mouth to tell me some BS like that. When Jones refused to comply with this request, the job offer was rescinded. Jones filed a complaint with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, alleging that the company's grooming policy was discriminatory. 
The EEOC ruled in favor of Jones, stating that the company's policy amounted to racial discrimination. However, the case was later dismissed by a federal court highlighting the need for stronger legal protections against hair discrimination. It is difficult to determine the exact number of hair discrimination cases filed annually in North America, as many incidents of hair discrimination go unreported and unresolved. However, according to the National Urban League, hair discrimination is a pervasive issue that affects a significant number of black people in the United States. In a survey conducted by the organization in 2019, 80% of black women reported that they have had to change their natural hair to conform to social norms at some point in their lives. The Crown Act, which seeks to address this issue, has been passed in several U.S. states and is gaining momentum across the country. So where is the Crown Act ratified? California, my home state, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Colorado, Washington, Maryland, also Oregon and Illinois, Nevada's another state, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Mexico, we've got Delaware on the list, we've also got Nebraska, Minnesota, Tennessee, Maine, and Alaska. So that's 19 states in which this act has been passed completely. But now in Georgia, Arizona, Texas, Florida, North Carolina, Kentucky, Mississippi, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, they have at least one city within its jurisdiction that have ratified this act. So who does the Crown Act affect? People who wear their hair curly. Hair discrimination disproportionately affects those with the curliest hair, i.e. black folks, people with locks and braids, basically any person that doesn't have hair that gatekeepers deem appropriate. This is not to say that black people don't uphold respectability in beauty politics. I worked at a black firm in Washington, D.C., then affectionately called Chocolate City due to its over 80% black population. My hair was about five inches long, natural, healthy, and well-groomed. The firm was planning for a visit from a company owned and operated by white folks. In D.C. at that time, in order to obtain government contracts, it was strongly encouraged that businesses have minority partnerships. So the CFO, a black woman and a soror, comes to me and tells me that I need to get my hair under control. They were so pressed to make a good impression on those white folks. I told them, um, don't worry about me. I will look presentable as I always do. Fast forward to the meeting, as soon as those people hit the door, they walked right over to me and complimented me on my hair. I mean, one man was just all up in my face, leaning over my desk. I just shot a look at my black colleagues like, y'all are pitiful. And I know you just heard what this man said. And it's not just black people who have to deal with such nonsense. I had an Arab client born and raised in France with Tunisian parentage confide in me that when she straightened her hair, her white colleagues would remark how much more professional she looked. The vilifying of black hair. Standards of beauty evolve and morph over time. When I was coming up, the standard was much more Eurocentric. Today, fuller lips and hips is much more desired on non-black people. Black women have long complained about how the features we were blessed with naturally are unattractive and managed until a non-black woman possesses them, whether paid for or through DNA. Texturism is a thing. It's bosom buddies with colorism. Texturism, also known as hair texture discrimination, refers to the social and cultural bias against hair textures, particularly those associated with black and African descended people. 
This form of discrimination can manifest in various ways, such as workplace policies that prohibit natural hairstyles, biased school dress codes, and negative societal attitudes towards natural hair textures. It's a serious issue that can have significant impacts on an individual's self-esteem, opportunities, and overall well-being. All of these isms are designed to maintain the status quo while locking the majority of humans out of financial independence, freedom, joy, and self-determination. Hey there, fashion lovers. Are you ready to explore Nairobi's fashion scene like a local? Join me, your personal wardrobe stylist, on an unforgettable fashion tour that will take you off the beaten path. Skip the malls and crowded Maasai markets, and let's go where market vendors purchase products wholesale. Then we'll experience hidden gems and the best eclectic boutiques in Nairobi, followed by lunch at one of the city's best farm-to-table restaurants. As an experienced wardrobe stylist, I will provide you with personalized style advice and help you find the perfect ensembles to match your personality and taste. You'll also get the opportunity to meet local designers and learn about their creative processes. If you're an adventurous traveler who enjoys unique and beautiful things, this half-day fashion tour was created for you. I've already discovered the best and most eclectic so you can avoid tourist traps. Whether you're a fashion enthusiast or simply looking for a fun and informative way to experience Nairobi, our eclectic fashion tour is the perfect choice. Book your spot now via Airbnb experiences and get ready to indulge in Nairobi's unique fashion culture. The other ring of black hair outside of Africa is to be expected. Instead of our uniqueness treasured and admired, it is exoticized at best and vilified at worst. In the United States, the only black hair that is admired is that which is the most proximate to straight. Even within natural hair communities, we see a preference for larger curls. Being othered gives people and institutions permission to deny your humanity and share resources. The hyper-focus on black people. I'm going to focus on the United States since this is where the act was created. However, these issues plague the world. Black people make up 13% of the U.S. population on a good day, and yet our presence is feared. We are often the only or less than a handful of black people in schools, workplaces, and entire cities. My family was the only black family in Burbank, California in the late 80s. Consequently, I was the only self-identified black person in my school for a couple of years. There were two other people of African descent, but they did not self-identify. Generally speaking, we are not welcome in most spaces because insecure non-black people are fragile and move with a philosophy of a lack and limitation. They tend to focus on anyone that is different from them and make it an issue. All black people know how it is to be clocked, micromanaged, and how the tiniest perceived infraction, like not smiling hard enough, will be reported as a disrespect, impolite, and HR call to get involved despite having the highest KPIs. I can recall managing a Fortune 500 retail store in Southern California. I had the most sales and was always asked to represent the company at special events. My manager had the nerve to tell me that I wasn't excited enough. She encouraged me to smile more and have more energy. Never mind that she moved so fast, my staff asked me if she was on coke. When people don't want you in a space, they will dream up a reason to get your ass out. This issue of hyper-focus, hair discrimination, colorism, and texturism affects men and boys too. One well-known example of hair discrimination in sports involved a black boy in the case of Andrew Johnson, a high school wrestler in New Jersey. In 2018, Johnson was forced to cut off his locks in order to compete in a wrestling match. 
despite the fact that his hair had been covered by wrestling headgear that met the rules of the sport. The referee of the match gave Johnson an ultimatum to either cut his hair or forfeit the match, which caused a public outcry and sparked a national conversation about hair discrimination. The New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association later apologized to Johnson and implemented new rules to prevent hair discrimination in high school sports. So how do black women circumvent the control? How do we cope? There are at least five ways that black women attempt to mitigate hair discrimination. One strategy is that we try to get our hair as close to the Eurocentric standard as possible. Black women have actually outdid non-black women via weaves, lace fronts, wigs, chemical hair straighteners, and black girl magic hairstyling techniques. Second strategy for employment candidates is to rock wigs during the interview and probationary period. Then all bets are off after the three-month period is up. Third, some of us shun the expectations altogether. We realize that the employer or lover that expects us to play the game doesn't want us anyway. And so we avoid employers and lovers that prefer a more Eurocentric participant. Fourth, we self-medicate with shopping, food, alcohol, sex, perfectionism, overachieving, outperforming, and people-pleasing. There are a myriad of ways that people cope with pain. Lastly, we confide in each other, and sometimes we speak with a therapist and our creator. Black hair ain't safe nowhere. The policing of Afro hair in African workplaces, just when I thought African women in African workplaces in Africa were safe to wear their natural hair, my Ugandan girlfriend expressed to me that she was very intentional in styling her beautifully locked hair in conservative buns so as not to rock the boat at her job where she is a senior exec. Her Zimbabwean friend concurred. I was shocked because after all, we are in Africa, the birthplace of African hair. Child, when will we get ourselves together? Employment equals the right to control. Appearance police, nails, color, clothes, hair. I recall during one of my law symposiums where a white Jewish male classmate instigated that everyone had to adapt in the workplace. He cited having to shave and wear a tie as an example which was something he didn't want to do, but he did it to get a check. Everyone, including the professor, could see there is a big difference in shaving versus being forced to change the molecular structure of your hair. But the point was lost on him. Across the board, whether you work at a liberal startup or an uptight law firm, your employer pays you for your label and intellect, but thinks they have ownership over your entire being in and outside of the workplace. Irrespective of your ethnicity or appearance, they will codify how you must look in their employee manual. In many cases, the employees themselves will police each other, poking their nose and other folks' business and running up on you to tell you how your hair, your nails, and your clothing is inappropriate. I used to manage an Ann Taylor store at the Beverly Center in Los Angeles. What I enjoyed the most was styling my clients. I recall selecting a gray pantsuit for my client along with a royal purple blouse. My client told me that she couldn't wear the shirt at her law firm and how an older woman lawyer approached her and told her how inappropriate she was to wear bright colors to work. Whether your employer has the right to dictate your appearance or not, they expect conformity. And when they don't get it, you can expect a paper trail to follow to try to push your ass out. Are you ready to take the leap and make your blacks into Africa? I'm an African-American expat living my best life in Nairobi, Kenya.
and I'm here to help. Within a one hour organic consultation, I can guide you through the entire process from choosing the right country to helping you settle in once you arrive. As someone who has made the journey, I understand how daunting it can be. But with my expertise, you can make your blacks it with ease. Don't wait another day to start living your best life. Book your consultation today and let's make your blacks it dreams a reality. Racism is insidious. While in law school, I had classmates advise me on how to secure employment. They said, make an appointment with the Colorado Bar Association, interview, and they'll place you. So I went, age 23, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, in my new suit and my hair in a cute TWA. That's a teeny-weeny afro for those who don't know. So this middle-aged white woman that sat across the desk from me could not stop staring at my hair. She was clearly looking above my eyebrows. Towards the close of the interview, I asked, will my hair be a problem? In which she frantically replied, oh, 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 oh no, oh, oh no. Child, I never heard from the CBA again. Consequently, I was never placed like my classmates. Then, <laughs> during my senior year of undergrad, I dated a collegiate football star. He was among the top players at my D1 school. At some point, I braided my hair with extensions. This was in the early 90s when the only women who braided their hair were women who had difficulty growing it. So my misguided boyfriend responded to my new do by telling me he'd break up with me if I didn't remove the braids. He said he was joking, but we know there was some truth to it. I left to study at the University of Ghana when I returned, he was with a white woman whom he eventually married and had children with. This is not a coincidence. Despite earning a BA in African American studies, he still hadn't learned how to love himself and his people fully. I've had non-black men at work asked to touch my hair and asked during my promotion interview how I was able to achieve a certain hairstyle. Do I need to tell you that I didn't get that promotion? And in the case of the guy asking me to touch my hair, I told him no. And then I asked him, I said, now, are you married? He said, yes, I'm married. I said, now, if your wife is at work, and a black man comes up to her and asks to touch her hair, how would you feel? Would you like that? He was like, oh no, I, no, I wouldn't like that at all. I mentioned a black firm in DC earlier. I like to unpack the indoctrinated self-hate that black people carry with them. We all know how media and various sub-societies impact how we perceive, think, move, believe, and breathe. At this point, it shouldn't be a mystery. Know that it's all deliberate. Now it's time to unlearn what was shoved down our throats. Some of us learned at home. For people like myself, I learned about the beauty hierarchy out in the larger world. This is why representation matters. Those messages are insidious and if left unchecked, deadly. I'm nearly a half century old with an academic education supported by African history and culture. To this day, I check myself on my beliefs and the crazy little things I say in my head to myself. Sometimes I ask myself, where the hell did that come from? Tadre, shut up. If we are to achieve true freedom and self-actualize, we have to challenge belief systems that are not our own. It's not yours if one, 
it did not originate with you. If two, it makes you uncomfortable. Aside from becoming more comfortable in our blackness and our Africanness, we must focus on removing ourselves from the matrix so that we are not relying on others for a check. For some, that could mean living off the grid. For others, it could mean entrepreneurship or only working for Black-led organizations. For all of us, it can mean speaking up when you or someone else is harmed. Whether you write an email or are responsible for a progressive memo or going on record against the people that harm. If you have the bandwidth, seek legal representation. I know firsthand that it can be difficult to find your voice, to look in the mirror and face your beauty, but it is necessary for our self-actualization, for our freedom. There are some people who will say that they are joyful, that they have self-actualized, or know someone who has. I would say that I was also joyful in the U.S., but I knew that I could be happier, and there's the difference. I knew that there was more to life. It wasn't until I had lived outside the U.S. for two years that I began to truly see how I had been stifled and how fucked up the entire system really was and continues to be. Moving to Africa will not be the answer to all your problems. You know the saying, wherever you go, there you are. As long as we are on this planet, we will have to deal with gravity and predators. But we can mitigate it. Go where the love is. That's it for now. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Blacks to Africa. If you liked what you heard, please share and leave a review. May you thrive. May you be inspired. May you move with love and intention. Until next time.